All right, this week on the show, we are talking all things Alabama, not just football, basketball as well. And joining me, good friend of the show, Tony Sakalis. You can check him out over at TideIllustrated.com, where he is the managing editor, part of Rivals over there. And, Tony, appreciate you, you coming on the show. Yeah, yeah, anytime, man. A busy time. I think it's, you know, I said I had somebody on from LSU last week. I think it's everybody right now that covers teams, like especially if you got a team in a tournament, which with Alabama, you got men and women. Then you got spring football going on, baseball, softball. So it's, it's a busy. It's probably one of the busiest times of the year if you're covering one of the universities. Uh, we stick to um, football and basketball, but I will say, also at Alabama, they've got one of the best gymnastics teams. So if you're like trying to cover it all, that's just add that in there as well. So um, yeah, it, it's a busy time. A lot of people don't realize the spring is when all the games are you know that's when all the you know when, when you have multi games i mean most people in the in the fall you're really just worried about football right and now football is its own beast but it's not as many sports and so the spring definitely keeps you on your toes in, in, in terms of especially if you're a fan and you're trying to get to all these games i can't imagine yeah just keeping up with all the, i guess football is mainly like during the week it's just going to press conferences going to practice talking to players during the week but you only got the game there at the end of the week on saturday but when you yeah. sprinkle in uh like i said these other people that do do baseball softball and fans and then basketball it, it's just it, if you're trying to keep up with all of them it's a it's a task yeah it could become like a daily thing i'm sure i mean yeah in the spring you could probably find a way to go to a game every single day so it's yeah. like um, I always think about it, man. It's it's a job. I mean, all of it's dedication. All of it's because we love it. We love sports. But like these guys, these beat writers for Major League Baseball teams, that it's an everyday grind for them too. As well, I always think about. Oh, those guys. I can't even imagine. And can you imagine on the baseball? Like just like if you wanted to go like MLB, right? I mean, like it's imagine you have a family and you're on the West Coast for a West Coast swing for you know ten games or so. You know, it's like you're away from your family for two weeks, and it's just constant travel but yeah it'd be tough and that's a cool thing about football i guess is that even on the road games you know you're not you're only away from home for a couple days and then you're back you know it's not like you have to if you're if you're playing on the road in tennessee you're not up in knoxville the whole week you're just coming up for the weekend so that that's the cool thing about football um but yeah it, it can be a, a bear for some of those especially when you get to professional sports sure Unless you're covering Notre Dame, and every other year you got to go to Ireland to cover a game. Yeah, so. there's there's that too. I mean, I, hey, I wouldn't I wouldn't turn down a trip to Ireland though. I'll tell you that. As, uh, absolutely. So uh, we're actually going to start with Alabama basketball for a few minutes. Uh, we, you know, everybody knows generally a football podcast, but uh, Alabama, Auburn, all of, you know, they're good in basketball. So in the tournaments here, it's March Madness week. Uh, just four seed. Do you think that was the right spot for Alabama? Yeah. I mean, I, I think some, you know, some of the naysayers, if you will, using a football term maybe, or some of the negative uh, Alabama fans, real, uh, you know, that I saw I was like, oh, I'm surprised they're not a fifth or a sixth seed. It's like, well, let's not forget that, you know, like a month ago, we were talking about this team possibly winning the SEC. Um, I think four is, is about right, about what they should be considering the body of work this season. Um, they're not as bad as what they've been playing like, but I don't think they're as good as – you know, what people thought they might be in a two seed or something like that. So uh, I think that it's a, a well-deserved four seed. You got to also look at the schedule that Alabama played. Um, they didn't win all their, they didn't win a lot of their uh, quad one games, but they challenged themselves and their record could have certainly been better if they played an easier schedule. So um, yeah, I think that's about, that's about fair. And, and this is the first time uh, Philip that they've gotten, Back to back seasons with a four seed or better, which is kind of crazy in in, uh, in program history to have that. So that says a lot about uh, Nate Oates. And you know, we're recording this on a on a Monday where Nate Oates just had his uh, new deal finalized. So uh, definitely, uh, you know, a hat tip to him uh, for uh, you know just the job he's done at Alabama since he's been here. Yeah, I know. I saw the, the story broke on Friday, and then it was before the Florida game, and then we saw how that one turned out. But, hey, that game probably didn't hurt Alabama because apparently the committee does not watch or care about the conference championships unless you're a, a surprise team that gets in. Uh, but, you know. Speaking so, from an Auburn perspective. <laughs> look, I'm in the state. I got to cover both of them, so I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I can see where you're wearing Auburn 
you know, uh, fan would be upset, especially with, you know, Kentucky getting a three seed and uh, you know, Auburn won the tournament, gets seated below Kentucky. I could see where they'd be upset about it. Um, but I, I think, yeah, I mean, I, like, I guess you could say for Auburn after winning the SEC tournament that they should be a three, but I, I don't really think that they're, I think four is about where they belong as well. A four seed's not a bad seed, you know? I mean, mm-hmm. that's, that's, that's pretty, pretty good. I think I think the part I think that probably bothered a lot of Auburn fans was, I, and I know Kentucky beat Auburn, but the fact is Kentucky got beat their first game, and then Auburn runs through the tournament, and then they were tied for second place in the conference, and then Auburn runs through and wins it. But I, I just think I think it's been that way for a while. I don't think the committee much cares about the conference championships for like the power conferences, unless like you would have had like a Georgia or an Ole Miss or somebody or an Arkansas like that run through and. Obviously, they get in. They get into the tournament. Outside of that, I don't think they much. They don't really. Make yeah. Much well, I mean, it. and I, for partially for good reason. Look, I don't want to take away what Auburn did. Auburn, the, winning the SEC tournament's hard, you know. But like, let's also look at it. Like, part of the reason why Auburn didn't get a lot of credit for winning the SEC tournament is like everybody, like all the the high seeds in the in the SEC tournament, lost their first game. You yeah. Know? I mean, like they played South Carolina, and then it got progressively easier. You know, mm-hmm. it's like. Um, so, you know, kudos to Auburn for like not choking like the rest of the SEC did, but, uh, they also won their title without playing. I think it would have been a different story if Auburn won the SEC title and would have, you know, beaten some of the bigger teams. And it, look, if they win the SEC title and beat Tennessee, you know, I think it's a different story. I think that they probably do get moved up. It, it almost hurt Auburn that all those upsets happened because they didn't get the chance to, to beat them. Yeah, they they probably need at least Tennessee or Kentucky to not uh, uh, fumble all over themselves in but, the in the first game. And it would have beat an SEC title is an SEC title, though. I mean, they should be happy yeah. about that. Like you know, oh, yeah. it, it, it really isn't that much difference between a three and a four seed. I guess you avoid the the number one seed, but that's it. Yeah, that's it. Um, uh, you look at this team. Like we, you know, they play Charleston on Friday. Um, this is a Charleston team that's won twelve straight. Uh, they won their conference. I was just looking at some stuff. They're these are three point shooting team, thirty five percent. They give a lot of points. Just well, Alabama, you you expect Alabama to win this game? I think. Look, this is a tournament. You never know. It's just the, one of the things why we love it so much because it's just the unpredictability of the NCAA tournament. What kind of run do you think this Alabama team could go on? Well, starting with Charleston, it's kind of an interesting one because they're very similar to Alabama, and I, like you can view that as a good thing because, like, you know, if any, if any, if Alabama is trying to get ready for a Charleston offense that moves pretty fast, that likes to shoot a lot of threes, that can score. All you have to do is look at themselves because they, they see that every day in practice. On the flip side, Alabama can't stop anybody on defense right now. And do you really want to play a team with a hot offense that can shoot, that can maybe get you in trouble? Charleston might go on a run. And then, you know, does Alabama have the defensive intensity to stop that? You know, um, probably, but you know, right now it doesn't seem very optimistic. Uh, so there's, there's two ways to look at it though. I, I do think they beat Charleston. Then you got probably St. Mary's and that could be a tough one. You look at, you know, Nate Oates brought it up too. It's like, not only is St. Mary's a good team, you, you're over there in the West coast, you know, Alabama's playing in Spokane. It's not going to matter against Charleston because they're both going cross country. If any, you know, Charleston have, has an eat. So that might, that might be the farthest away place that Charleston could have been sent. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that it won't matter against Charleston, but maybe against the St. Mary's they'll have to play in front of more St. Mary's fans. Um, you know, Alabama's kind of done that with Purdue and, uh, Toronto. And then they also had Arizona at Phoenix. So, I mean, Alabama's kind of used to playing neutral site games that where there aren't neutral sites, but that will be a tough one. And if they win that, I have to, I have to look at the rest of the bracket. I really need to study up, but um, I haven't really looked past that to see uh, how the bracket will work, but um, I think it starts with that, you know, getting out of that, that first weekend. Um, it's going to be tough. I think they really just got to take it one game at a time. Cause if you overlook Charleston, that's a team that's won 12 straight games. Um, they can really score. They can really shoot. They, they've got a, a, you know, a young up and coming coach. And um, that's a team that could upset Alabama if they're not careful. Yeah. I got uh, Alabama's part of the bracket. Uh, in front of me so uh, the other part of that bracket teams they would play the following the second weekend north carolina playing the 16 we don't know who they're playing yet because of the first four and then north carolina would play prop 
or I'll just assume North Carolina wins that, then play either Mississippi State or Michigan State. So you're probably looking at if you get through weekend one, you're probably looking at uh, North Carolina. UNC. Yeah, it's probably UNC. That's that's tough, you know. But I mean, I feel like Alabama can play with with those teams. I don't think Alabama can't play with UNC. Um, and, and like, look, did. It, it, you know, NATO said it was a new season. It's kind of a good way to think of it. Like if Alabama can like right the ship this weekend, going into next weekend with a little bit of momentum, I don't want, I don't, if you know, if I'm a, a UNC, I, I don't want to play them, you know? Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I think that um, it could get interesting. It's just a matter of, you know, which Alabama will we get the Alabama that, you know, had a chance of winning the SEC tournament or sorry sorry regular season title are the alabama that's lost you know what four or five games now or so so it's just it's just kind of tough uh talking about football as we mentioned on top spring practices is going on leading up to 8 a game on the 13th of april just uh for you going into this what were some of the big storylines for alabama uh with spring practice yeah, I think, you know, it starts with the uh, secondary and the offensive line. You know, Alabama doesn't really have – I think you have – you know, you could you could pretty much slot Elijah Pritchett at that left tackle role now. But as far as the other tackle goes, I mean, um, right now it's Wilkin Formby, a redshirt freshman. Um, if it wasn't him, it'd be Miles McVay, who's a redshirt freshman. Neither of those guys have many snaps. And to be honest, you know – you got on the other side, you've got Elijah Pritchett who, you know, couldn't beat out a struggling Caden Proctor. So like, it's kind of weird. You, know, you look at that offensive line, you've got Jaden Roberts and Tyler Booker and now probably Parker Brailsford uh, or, or James Brockmeyer. I don't want to write him off, but like you've got the interior of that offensive line that could be really strong. One of the best in the nation. And then you look at the tackle positions and you're like, man, like those are two huge question marks. And obviously the tackle positions are, are extremely important. Um, so that's a that's an area of like really what what is Alabama going to get out of those tackle positions? Uh, I think after spring camp, you'd expect them to grab someone from the portal, but you've still got to know what you have in terms of that position, and that's going to determine a lot of Alabama's success. So obviously, one of the things I'll be continuously monitoring is that. And then if you look at the secondary, you know, the only starting cornerback they have, or sorry, the only experienced cornerback they have is uh, Damani Jackson, who started 11 games for USC last year. Outside of him, they don't have a single cornerback that's played a college snap. Uh, Jalil Hurley comes back after a redshirt freshman year, but he didn't play a lick last fall. And they've got some really, uh, you know, it, you know, exciting young freshmen that are coming in. Um, Jalen Mbakwe, Zay Mincy, um, Zavian Brown. But I, we'll have to see what those guys are are, are going to do. And you, you don't necessarily want to throw a uh, freshman cornerback as a starter, especially not with, you know, the offenses of today where they're airing it out. You kind of like to break those guys in a little bit. So you look to the portal again, can Alabama get a, a cornerback that maybe, you know, can help them out a little bit. I think they will be more experienced. Like, I think you'll have a better shot of getting like a, a superstar cornerback. If one of those hits the portal, than you would necessarily getting a superstar tackle. So if you look at what Alabama is going to get from the portal, like I think you just need like a serviceable veteran on the line, and then maybe you just kind of hope that maybe you can get that star cornerback if, you, if he's out there. You know, I don't know what the market's necessarily going to look like, but you know, there's been rumors around like I'm just throwing this into space. This is not, you know, Carmani McLean, somebody like that, like a five star kid. You know, somebody mm-hmm. like that was to go. I think Alabama should definitely throw their their name their hat in the ring for a guy like that and. um but there'll be other guys, you know, that are that are big time talents. I think Alabama should throw their hat in. Uh, but same same situation as a uh, tackle, right? You you, you got to see what what you have, and both of those positions are going to be big. And then maybe the third position I'd look at is quarterback. Um, I, I think it's it's so weird. It, you know, when I'm trying to predict how good Alabama is going to be, it's almost impossible without knowing how good Jalen Miro is going to be because. You know, we've seen Jalen Milrose struggles, and there's obviously question about, like, what if it doesn't work in, in, in Kalen DeBoer's offense? Everyone's asking that. But, like, what if it does work? I mean, you have a chance to have this really deadly player. I mean, if Jalen Milrose can tweak his passing a bit and, and you know, kind of find more of his, quote-unquote, mid-range game and hit those intermediate passes, and if, you know, Kalen DeBoer can kind of unlock that in him, we're talking about, you know, just a, like a nightmare guy with, the, with you know, with the Boar's offense and how he can spread the ball around and, you know, the the threat that Jalen would have on draw plays. I mean, you really couldn't 
defend this offense if he was able to do that. That's just a huge if, though. I mean, like you look at the way Jalen Milrow played, um, he didn't really do a lot to show you that he's going to fit in in this offense. But then we've heard great reviews of him this spring so far. So look to see how he's doing. And if he struggles, then I think it could get really interesting because I think you look at some of the guys behind him, Ty Simpson decided to stick around. He's got a great arm. He's a guy that's progressed behind the scenes. He didn't get to play a lot last year, obviously, because Milrow was the guy. But I think Ty Simpson's probably taken a, a step in the right direction. Um, they got Dylan Lonergan, who looked really good in the spring game. But then the guy I'm really high on, if, if Jalen wasn't, you know, if, if, if it does become a quarterback battle, the guy I would say to keep the biggest eye on is Austin Mack, who transferred from Washington. Um, he's a guy that obviously knows Kalen DeVore's offense already, and he can sling it, and he's 6'6". Six, six. Um, you know, you, you, you see him on the practice. We've only got to see one practice, but you, you see him on the practice field. He just stands out because he's like a, a giant over there and he's slinging the ball. So um, the quarterback position, it, it's, it's a question mark, but not as big of a one because you know, whoever Alabama has behind center, they've got plenty of talent. Uh, it's just a matter of, will they find the right quarterback? Will Jalen be the right quarterback? Um, I think their best shot is that like their best shot at winning is, is for Jalen Milrow to, progress and be that guy be you know um obviously that's the most preferred option for alabama but it, it'll be interesting to see if that happens uh and i think that's gonna those three areas tackle defensive back and uh quarterback that's that's your alabama season right there how those three areas progress this spring this summer that you know if you get a production out of both of all those three spots alabama's write them right there in for the title they, they have a shot at it. Like the, the rest of the roster is really good. Um, but those are just three really important positions that Alabama has, you know, big to sizably big, um, you know, uh, question marks at. So just be kind of interesting to see how things progress there. Yeah, it will be. I kind of, when I asked that question, I, I feel like corner would be one just in the secondary overall, just for how much they lost, uh, especially to Caleb Downs transferred to Ohio state. And then offensive line, maybe I didn't expect quarterback. Uh, it just kind of fell out. Uh, you know, and you kind of answer one of my questions. Just I think that is the question: How does he fit in uh, um, the board's offense? And you're right. If if he becomes a better passer, I don't think he you need to expect him to be like Michael Penix. No, like, they're totally different quarterbacks. Yeah. He won't be Michael Penix because that's just not in his game. You know, mm-hmm. like, Michael Penix can't run the ball like like Jim Miro can. Exactly. So, yeah, that's that's a part of it. You know, it also kind of interesting, you know, with Washington, you just think of Washington as a, a, a passing offense. I mean, two 1,000-yard receivers and the talent's there. And of course, with Ryan Williams, and, you know, maybe I had a wiregrass. I'm kind of interested to see how Emmanuel Henderson develops as a receiver. But the running backs uh, there, too, at, you know, Alabama, you know, McK- McKellen and Williams, they're gone. Now, the two guys are most veteran, Justice Haynes and Jack Miller. I know last year around this time, we were all excited what we saw out of Haynes out of the spring. So be interested how you, uh, how, how you see him using the running backs. I think it's going to be those two uh, as the, as the main guys. I think you're going to see a little bit more from Richard young too. I mean, I think a lot of people forgot about Richard young, but he's another either high four, four or five star guy, depending on how you look at him, what, at which service you use. So um, he's going to be good. And you know, you're Daniel Hill, uh, Kevin Riley. I think they're more, I mean, maybe they would step in if somebody got hurt, you know, into the rotation. But I think they're more for the future. I, I'm expecting it to be kind of a split between Justice and Jam with a little bit of Richard Young. Um, I, people forget about, like, it's all about pass blocking, too, right? So, if like, if Justice Haynes is the better, like, runner right now and Jam Miller is the better pass blocker, then Jam Miller is going to be the starter. You know, and I'm not saying that one of those is definitely better than the other. And it kind of seems like they're both. A little bit pretty pretty even at what they can do they the good thing about those two backs is you know we've seen both of them catch out of the backfield we've seen both of them show the ability to to make plays in open space so it's not like it's not necessarily like a thunder lightning i think it might just be a hot hand kind of thing you know or just just to keep people fresh but i think the good thing about you know alabama's options and i think you could probably put richard young there we haven't really seen him but i think you could probably put him in there as like they can all do everything so you know you can use them interchangeably and i think that that's pretty important yeah and if you got one that's a really good pass blocker the other's not where you're going to play the one that's a really good pass blocker most of the time because if you if you rotate them out you know what they're about to do i mean and that's you know then you might slow down your offense too um 
on the on defense, you, you talked about the defensive backs, and I had wrote stuff down here. But a uh, linebacker, I mean, obviously, you think about Dallas Turner, Chris Braswell, those guys. You lose those kind of players. But you know, in the past, what they say, you used to losing those guys and other players standing up. I know Deontay Lawson is one. Uh, where, where do you see Alabama going with linebacker? So, like the inside linebacker, I think you know that's probably one of their strengths, right? Because you got Deontay Lawson and Jahad Campbell. Mm-hmm. Now, the depth after that, you know, with a um, Justin Jefferson, um, I think, you know, is he big enough or can he be a guy like, like your, your, your depth pieces at inside linebacker, um, Jeremiah Alexander is a guy that you might be able to use as a depth piece at inside linebacker, but he played outside linebacker last year. So he's still transitioning. You got a Juco guy in Jefferson that, um, like, you know, is he, do you really want him having to start if that was the case? But uh, another thing that just when you look at linebackers as a whole, it's one of the differences in this team is the way it's built compared to the way that, you know, Kane Womack runs his defense, right? They're going to that strict, that four, two, five um, swarm D where, you know, I think the biggest difference comes at that outside linebacker edge position where Alabama before, you know, you had your Sam and Jack linebackers and those were kind of similar body types, right? Not, not always the, the exact same role, but similar body types. And now you're going to have the Wolf linebacker that's going to be built a little bit more like what the Jack or Sam linebacker was. But then you're going to have the Bandit. Um, that's more of a defensive lineman at that point. That guy is probably like 265, 270. So Alabama has a lot of uh, Wolves, our Wolf position. They got a, a big Wolf pack. I joked about that with uh, Kane Womack uh, earlier this month. Uh Maybe they like they they have some bandits too, but like it's almost like a where are you going to put all these? If you have enough wolf players or enough edge stand up kind of edge guys to play two different positions, how are you going to condense that to where one mix defense is really going to have one guy? So I think in terms of depth at inside, like could some of these stand up edge guys lose some weight and maybe provide depth to inside or especially if they had to in an emergency situation, I think that might be an Avenue that Alabama goes to. It'll also just be interesting to see like what Alabama does to get some of these guys on the field. You know, I mean, Quindarius Robinson's probably your starting um, wolf, but then you've got Yanzi Pierre in there and uh, you know, Noah Carter who they brought in. And then like uh, they got Keon Keeley. He's going to supposedly move. He's working with the bandits. So he's probably going to try to gain 20 pounds and get up to like, you know, 260 instead of 240, you know? So that'll be interesting um, to see. I mean, they lose a lot of their pass rushers, but they had such a deep unit. It's just now younger guys stepping up. I mean, Keon Keeley and Yanzi Pierre, two five-star guys, Quay Russaw too that didn't play at all last year, but they've got some talent, you know, I mean, they, they, they came in as really high recruits. So we're going to get to see a lot more of them now. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. It's, it's, it's just a very interesting time. Uh, that first spring game, you know, after Nick Saban, uh, after Nick Saban, the first one of K- for Kaylin Abor, which I think is probably a big reason why it's going to be on ESPN uh, on the 13th, but it's going to be interesting. A lot of people going to be paying attention to what's going on in Alabama in their spring practice and in the 8A game. And uh, Tony, it's been fun. Have you talk all things Alabama? I did not know Auburn basketball was going to work its way in. Yeah, we, we spent a long time talking about it. Uh, we talked about Major League Baseball, talked about uh, Auburn basketball. So even if you're not a, uh, a fan of Alabama and you tuned in, I guess you got a little bit of everything. Hey, it flew a well. good. It's all about the conversation, all about the conversation. Uh, but anyways, Tony, it's been fun having you on. Uh, let the listeners and viewers know where they can find you and all the work you're doing. Yeah, the site's tidillustrated.com. You can go to alabama.rivals.com. You can follow us at Tide Illustrated, or you can follow me at Tony underscore Sukalis. And my looks like my name's up there. So if you don't know how to spell Sukalis, it's right there. Uh, so, yeah, just give, give us both – give me a follow and give uh, Tide Illustrated a follow as well. All right, sounds good, Tony. Once again, appreciate the time and uh, look forward to talking to you again sometime down the road. Definitely. Thanks.